we've got, you can might be able to tell this is not Lynn Sosnowski. This is Tim Miller, who graciously agreed to step in because Lynn is sick and wasn't able to make the trip over. So um, with that, I'll hand it over to Tim Miller, presenting on behalf of Lynn Sosnowski, Bindweed Biology, Ecology, and Management. Thanks, Betsy. Yes, I feel your pain. I am not Lynn Sosnowski. Um, she's a much better scientist than me. Um, so you, the only, there's two pluses about this. One plus is that she put together the talk. So you're going to get the, the high intelligence part of this <laughs> that, that I am unable to provide. So I, I think that's really good. The second thing is you're still going to get a pesticide credit, right? So this is the important thing. That's why you're here. Yes. Okay, we're going to learn about bindweed. Now, the title that was in the book was about general and perennials, but um, this talk is predominantly about bindweed, specifically about bindweed, and specifically about field bindweed. We do have another bindweed species that we have more commonly out here, uh, especially in Skagit North, um, and that's our hedge bindweed. Different species, but it kind of goes through the same uh, biology and management seems to be about the same. So you can kind of use those interchangeably, the species that we have more of. Uh, if you happen to have field bindweed and there is field bindweed around, um, this will still provide you with some information. So that being said, let's uh, move along. Maybe my hung up. My arrows aren't working. What? Space bar. Doesn't like that either. Any other questions? Oh, wait, something happened here. There we go. Now it's working. Thank you. Uh, they got to love this. How many slides shows do you get with human interactions with bindweed? This is great. This is great. Bindweed has been around a long time, obviously. Greeks and Romans, like the Greeks and Romans, a long time ago, first century, they, they, had, they had names for it too. This was before our modern taxonomy kind of got going, but they had their own little names for it. Periclumenon, for all you Greek uh, lovers out there. Circling plant, it's a good name for the bindweed because it does turn the twine around things. And in, the, in Latin, volucromagus, yes. Um, worm in vines. <laughs> Uh, I don't know where they came up with that worm part, but uh, maybe because it twines around things again. Now, Linnaeus was kind of the father of modern uh, tech, uh, taxonomy. He coined the, the Latin binomial, convolvulus arvensis, and, and for us, field bindweed is known that way in, in scientific circles. Um, convolvulus was derived from a word, um, convolvare, meaning to entwine or to wrap around. And arvents means of the field. So we have like Circium arvents, Canada thistle, also means weedy in the field. So it's a really good name, very descriptive name for this particular species. Now, how about in the US? It's a European species, arrived to our shores 1739. They have actually a record of when it first was noted in Virginia. Probably came in on ship's ballast. A lot of the ships came over from um, the, the old world countries empty, so they, they're bringing in the, some supplies to the, the colonies back in the day. Uh, but they were sending things back, so they would dump a lot of that ballast onto the shore, uh, and wherever they collected that ballast in Europe, uh, whatever was in that seed-wise would also grow, and then suddenly we find these weeds present in the, on the East Coast as well. So that was back in 1739, it was first noted. Out west, I found this really interesting. Way to go, Lynn. The bindweed plant parts were present in bricks. So you think about the clay that they used to make bricks uh, to build the Juan Jesus Alejo uh, adobe in Fremont, California. And so that was in the mid 1800s. So somehow or another, it was able to jump from one coast to the other coast in that 100 years in between those two. And don't have a good sense for how that happened. They might have been connected underground. <laughs> it's probably the same plant, just grow across the country. Uh, or maybe it was a West Coast um, introduction as well, because San Francisco and other parts of California were, were ports as well. So a lot of different potentials there. Um, 1911, fast forward 1911, wild morning glory. And this, I, I learned this plant when I was growing up in, in Idaho. We called it morning glory. But 
nobody wants to kill morning glory. Finally, that's what we want to kill. The wild morning glory is one of the most troublesome weeds in vineyards, orchards, and other cultivated soils. And that was in 1911. So even then, they were finding this. <laughs> I'm not going to point anything. anybody here from Oregon. Oh, good. We can blame. Oh, sorry. I, I, won't, I won't point the finger then. Uh, rumor, this is strictly rumor, uh, at least in Lindsay, or, that was brought to Oregon as a ground cover. You think about a ground cover. You want something that basically covers the ground. You want something that is very little management required. You just, it, it grows itself, it reproduces itself, it does all this good stuff. So it's about this far between a good ground cover and a weed. And I think we kind of overdid it on the weed side with, uh, with mine weed. Um, it's been, so we've had this thing around for a long time. Um, this is a farm, USDA Farmer's Bulletin from 1908, 1908. And read these quotes. Are you kidding me? A great many farmers are looking for some easy method of killing bindweed. Uh, and I love this part. They, they let it cover the fields and festoon the trees. Festoon. There's a word I don't use very often, but I get to use it today. Um, so clearly was a problem even in 1908. Looking, farmers are looking for some magic remedy that will completely eradicate the weed in a small amount of exertion. <laughs> Aren't we all? Silver bullets don't exist typically for weeds and this would be a good case in point. It does require a tremendous amount of control. And remember this was in two, you know, 1908. They did not have uh, selective herbicides back then. Let's talk a bit about the biology of the plant, remembering that we're talking field biology of field bindweed and that our hedge bindweeds can be somewhat similar. This is the plant we're looking at. So if you've been wondering, okay, what's bindweed? Look kind of familiar. We got these funnel shaped flowers on there. Typically it's a very prostrate growth, right up flat on the ground, unless there's something for it to twine around and start growing upward. And that's what we usually see. Um, well, you oftentimes don't have bare ground. You did have bare soil. This is what you'd expect to see. Check out the, uh, the root system on this thing. This is, this is a drawing from, um, from a bulletin in 1930. Um, the vertical roots on this, which is this stuff in here, down to 30 feet. Yeah, it's not a typo, 30 feet deep. If you've got soil, it's got roots, okay? So it's gonna go way down. It's able to survive drought. It's able to do a lot of things because of that really intense root system. It can handle cold as well. I mean, this is just as much a problem up in North Dakota and, and Minnesota and places like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's able to live in our conditions very, very well. And because we have all these roots down here, there is a large nutrient reserve in the plant. So if it has a bad year, doesn't make a lot of new uh, photosynthates in that year, it'll still be able to survive and uh, start growing really well the next year. Uh, we do have these lateral roots as well, and it's the lateral roots that really cause us our problems as far as spread of the particular plant. And we'll talk about that in more detail. You look at uh, field bindweed. This is, uh, she's doing some work, Lynn is doing some work uh, in the greenhouse. And so these are from plants that she's growing in the greenhouse, so she excises them and able to take a look at it uh, very closely. And you can see that this is a, one of those horizontal roots that we were just talking about. If you think about it, the one root comes up and you get a, a plant starting to grow, if it moves over and then there's another plant coming in, so they'll root at these different locations. And in between those two, there's a creeping root, much like we get with Canada thistle. And in certain spots on there, there are adventitious buds on that root material that give rise to new shoot material. And so this is one of those that, that forms a plant. It's a clonal growth, which makes it really difficult. If it's well suited to the site, it's going to do very well. It tends to move in that direction vertically and horizontally as well. So you get the vertical movement, and then even from those roots, you can get lateral roots produced. So really quickly after the, the emergence of this plant, you start seeing this. It gets the, um, the buds all along this lateral root. Here, this is her way of showing that we're gonna get new shoots all along there. So this plant connects with this plant via that horizontal root. Make sense? So we see basically consolidation of a site and that's why we get such really thick populations. Now when do we get this? Um, this is from her greenhouse trial that she has going on right now looking at it. Uh, let me set this up on the, on the left side of the, the, the graph. This is the number of new shoots 
that are potential new shoots on the bindweed root. And if you look along here, this is weeks after emergence. So we have two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, and up to 10 weeks after emergence. And this line is showing that we get an increase in the number of shoots from that horizontal root start showing up even as soon as four weeks after emergence. They're already up to two, it looks like about two new shoots four weeks after that plant has emerged. And this is an excised plant that they, she's growing in a pot. So you can imagine in a big field sense where you've got a lot of plants present, you're gonna really pick up some new shoots very, very rapidly. After 10 weeks, she was over 20, looks like 26 new shoots on a greenhouse grown plant. So that's a lot of new shoots. That means a lot of new uh, uh, leaf material that's gonna feed that root system and lead to spread. So, roots are a big issue with any perennial plant, but particularly with bindweed, it's, it's one of the major ways that this plant spreads around, but it's not the only way that it spreads around. We also have a pretty intense seed production on this thing. Um, each one of these fruits, they follow, you, they have that funnel-shaped flower. For field bindweed, it's about an inch across. For our hedge bindweed, it's about three inches across. But what follows that is the fruit, and in each of these little fruits, there's four or five seeds in each one of those. And if you do the math, you start dealing with about 500 seeds per plant. And the catch-all here, oh my gosh, seeds can survive for 50 years, 50 years. So the plant that you see might have been germinating in the Johnson administration. Okay, so this was a long time, the first Johnson administration probably, back in the Civil War days. This thing was pretty intense. And those seeds are going to be around to reinfest the site. So even if you're successful of getting rid of this plant, the seeds are going to be there to be the gift that keeps giving. So bindweed management has got to include not only the current growth, but also account for those new seedlings that might show up. Okay, how do we, how do we control this? Now, one of the ways that they initially did, remember this is before herbicides particularly, Cutting the top growth, and we all know, you know if, it, if the root system doesn't have constant feeding from the shoots, then eventually that root system is gonna die. That's the idea behind this. And so if you, if you go out there and recreationally cut this off, cut this off, cut this off, cut this off, how long does it take to, to actually do this? And, and uh, there's a study out there that in 1911 here, Bioletti, 30 cuttings are necessary, 30. In your spare time 30 right or continually I even that's even better continually if you don't even count you're always out there cutting that's the idea um, there was actually a, a paper presented on this in 1951 this is the Journal of Agronomy um, Kansas study obviously Hayes Kansas Canton Kansas they, they looked at these two different uh, sites and they were cultivating every two weeks or cultivating every three weeks and eradication maybe is misnomer. What they're, what they're trying to do is get rid of this plant so that it doesn't come back again from the root system. How many times did they have to do that? Well, if they were cultivating every two weeks, it took them 28 cultivations, or 21, depending on the site, every two weeks. And so two weeks times 28 or 21 times is how many times they had to remove that top growth before they killed the plant. Every three weeks, they, they reduced it a little bit, right? It didn't take quite as many, but we're still dealing with a lot of different cultivations out there. I, I like this. This is the one that really breaks your heart. How, so if you take those numbers and you figure out how long it's actually going to take just from a cultivation moon, we're talking about two and a half, you know, anywhere from uh, 1.8 to 2.6 seasons. So that's two and a half years of constant cultivation to get ahead of this plant. Are you enthusiastic now? Yeah, me too. Um, there's more. Wait, there's more. That was for a fairly shallow cultivation. How about if we go a little deeper? Can we reduce that? Oh, yeah, you do a whole lot better. It only takes you 16 times to cultivating a foot deep. 16. So if you do that every 23 days, we're still talking over a year of cultivation just to get this plant under control. And you can imagine these soil people here, how many, if, if I cultivate every three weeks, what's that gonna to do to my soil? Not a good thing, right? Okay, they were looking for an easy solution, right? Are herbicides the answer? Well, maybe. Let's set the Wayback Machine this time to 1928. This is a Ag Experiment Station bulletin. I, how she got a photo of this, I, I don't know. She must have lived in the library. Um, 
what they were saying, it's, <laughs> you kind of read through this, pretty fun. They, they used a lot more flowery language back then, like, like festoon, right? Um, effective, but could be dangerous and expensive to control this plant. Uh, trials in the 1950s found use rate of sodium chlorate. Sodium chlorate uh, was what they kind of used, non-selective herbicide. Think of, of uh, putting salt out there to kill weeds. How much do they recommend back then? Only a thousand pounds per acre. A thousand pounds of sodium chlorate, and you can imagine what that would do to a blueberry. Yeah, it, it's not. It, it is completely non-selective. They used to do this on roadsides and places like that as well. But man, you can imagine that, and that's that's a one-time thing. Uh, you do it one year, and in our rainfall zones, they would have to do it again the next year and again the next year, and you're just suppressing the growth. Um, at a thousand pounds per acre, boy, that would add up, wouldn't it? But even in the modern herbicides, things that we have nowadays to, uh, that are more selective, that you get uptake, you get translocation in the plant, it still requires quite a lot of work and quite a lot of effort, really, to get ahead of this plant. We're, we're more or less into the modern era. You know, for, for me, 1986 seems pretty recent, right? But how long ago was that? 30 years. Okay, so 30 years ago. <laughs> I hate this. Um, Here's a, here's a trial that they did, and this is published in Weed Science. Timing played a big role in successful control of bindweed, as it does with many perennial species. They were able to achieve 84% control if they did their applications in the summertime when this plant was in flower. So you look at that, May to August were the applications. They were using glyphosate, so Roundup. Um, had just come out. It became uh, available pretty much in the 1970s. So this is fairly, was the way to control uh, by read at the time. It was about 85% control that they were getting if they applied it at flowering. And we can use that still today because flowering is a really good key that you want to kind of aim at. If you applied it before flowering or if you applied it after flowering, the flowering had been going for a while and you're looking more at a fall application, they did not achieve as good a control. Now this was, was done in the, in the plain states as well. Maybe a little different out here, but not a tremendous amount different. Think about what's going on with the plant physiologically and we can see that flowering is gonna be a really key timing for controlling bindweed. It's also an easy time to, to take a look at it because you can see the plant then. Then you're getting the big flowers. It's, it's hard to miss when it's in flower. Um, if you're looking at uh, flowering uh, as a whole, one of the reasons that this plant is doing so well is because you have high vigor at the time of flowering. That plant is actively photosynthesizing. It's putting, throwing a lot of sugar down the roots. And the herbicide, most of our translocating herbicides move with the photosynthate. So if we're getting good photosynthesis, rapid growth, that's the timing that we're going to get the most translocation from leaves down into the roots. Uh, so again, this April to May time frame, they were able to get really good vigor and fairly decent control. 75% control wasn't too bad. And again, if they waited till that August, November, probably was a bit drought um, affected by drought, whereas here we probably wouldn't have that same effect. And that's why I mentioned that maybe falls would be a little bit better for us out here where we get some moisture. Um, May to August, again, was also a fairly good timing because of the flowering aspect. Okay, remember that with a translocating herbicide, uh, especially with glyphosate, really the only way that you're going to get it to the roots is absorbing it into the plant. You've got to get it into the leaves of the plant in order to move it downward in the roots. Consequently, um, you want to have a fairly big target. The bigger the target means lots of leaves, lots of stems, you're going to get more uptake. You're going to get a lot more herbicide into the plant, which will then translocate and give you better control. So that's why you don't want to go very early. Wait till these plants get a little bigger before you do the applications. Poor vigor is another thing. So again, with drought, things like that, we've got a nice shot here of a powdery mildew uh, on the leaves of a bindweed. Uh, so if you're in central Washington, you probably have a better chance of getting uh, powdery mildew than we do out here in the West. Uh, however, anything that's going to reduce photosynthesis or reduce the ability of, the, of, in this case, glyphosate to move into the plant, then it's going to reduce the amount of control. So you want to have a big, healthy, rapidly growing plant, and you'll get better weed control. Isn't that kind of weird? But it's true. That's how it kind of works with perennials.
Okay, how do we manage it now? We don't have sodium chlorate uh, typically as a good selected product. Um, are there some things that we can do? Yeah, well, we still have cultivation, right? Uh, not so much in, in blueberry, but in fields in general. If you're in a, in a annually cultivated area, or if you're if you've got uh, say bindweed in in raspberry or something in between the rows, maybe you can do some level of uh, cultivation in there. Uh, typically, recommend every 14 days. So we're still talking about this every two weeks, going out and cultivate this as much as possible. Remember that if you just go out and cultivate one or two times, you're not controlling it; you're spreading because it only takes a little chunk, one to two inch chunk of that root to start a new plant. So you have to kind of do this over and over and over again, not letting them really establish, those plant pieces really establish and form a new plant. So you gotta keep this in mind. Uh, how about landscaping, cloth, weed fabrics, things like that. You know, these actually work pretty well on bindweed. Um, bindweed does not have a sharp tip to that shoot. It gets up against that weed mat, it hits that, and it starts growing sideways. Our problem with controlling a plant that really has a big horizontal spread is that it'll grow to the edge of that fabric and start growing up, or it'll go to the planting holes and grow up. Uh, if you actually pull that, that uh, fabric back, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting that you can see how this plant has done the same thing. Think horsetail, we get the same kind of growth pattern with that. So when you pull that back, you see where those shoots have been trying to grow, and eventually they're gonna grow into a hole. And that's just kind of how they do their thing. Um, biological control, we do have a couple things out there. Um, the, the fungus in particular has not been really effective for us. The, uh, the moth has not been particularly effective for us. We are seeing, however, they're spreading this, this mite around. This is a fairly new thing for us. We're just starting to see this. Um, I don't know if anybody here has been a cooperator with that. They have been looking more on the dry side of the mountains uh, to do this. It generally likes warmer conditions than what we can provide here in northwestern Washington. So I don't know that the mites going to be really effective for us, but they are releasing it. It causes uh, the plant basically to, it, it forms almost like, it looks like a cauliflower. When it comes up, it just kind of is, is torqued up. The mite does its job on the shoot material. Uh, so it does a fairly good job along those lines. Uh, and I know they've gone uh, releases as far north up into the Okanagan in, in Canada. So it's, it's around, we, we do have it available. The other flip side of this thing is that it doesn't spread very well on its own. Mites just don't move around very well. So it's not 100% uh, effective and maybe for us it's not the, the answer. Uh, how about herbicides? We got some herbicides these days, better maybe than that thousand pounds per acre of sodium chlorate. Yeah, we do. Um, these probably look familiar to many of you uh, blueberry producers. Isoxabin is gallery or trellis. Um, does have some activity. Uh, it'll actually even burn back the plant a little bit, but it's not going to be a one-shot deal by any means. Rim sulfuron is matrix. Uh, diclobenil is casseron, and casseron probably is the one that'll have the most effect on an established perennial, which most of ours are already established. Arizalin is, is surfland. So these are the products that have shown some level of control of this plant, either controlling the shoots, trying to grow up through treated soil, or if you happen to have some seed uh, germination, most of these will, will help on that. Of, of all these four, the casserone or diclobinil is, is the one that's going to have the best effect on an established bindweed population. So if you have that, start thinking, well, maybe I want to do some treatments with casserone during the wintertime. You know, so you could go out tomorrow and go out and, and treat. No, don't go tomorrow because we have a class tomorrow. Next week. Next week's when we want to do that. Uh, these two down here, glyphosate and 2,4-D. Um, many of you might have remembered back in the day, glyphosate plus 2,4-D was a prepackaged mix Monsanto had come out with, they called it uh, Landmaster, Landmaster BW for bindweed. That combination of the oxidic herbicide with the um, amino acid inhibiting herbicide glyphosate was a good combination. Two modes of action working together and you could really use it synergistically. So they, they came out with these kind of combinations. Probably still is a really good combination to use in blueberries. Now, 2,4-D, the only thing we can do in blueberries is in the grass rows uh, between in the alleyways. Uh, and I don't recommend using glyphosate in those grass rows because guess what? Glyphosate kills grass as well. But we do have a 2,4-D available, so that is a, is a potential for you. We have not seen good effect with some of these other foliar uh, applied products. Um, the matrix is mentioned here. I don't know Sandia has, no, 
sorry, Sandia is not going to help with bindweed. Uh, we do see some activity of Stinger, but it's, it's fairly weak. So if you're using clopyrrolid for controlling Canada thistle or something like that, you may see some suppression of the bindweed as well. Uh, this is one that's on the horizon, quinclorac. Maybe you've heard of this one. We're getting registrations in uh, a couple of crops. We were looking in raspberry. Uh, any of you rhubarb producers out there maybe uh, have seen this. We did get a uh, registration in rhubarb for, for quinclorac. It's been around a while. Uh, Quinstar is the one that's working with us. They're from uh, Alba Chemical Company. So uh, it would have to be that particular formulation. There are other formulations of quinclorac that are registered in other crops and rice and, and small grains. But it's really hot on bindweed in particular, and it's a post-emergence kind of application. So we've seen good selectivity, uh, particularly in blueberries. So if we do, it's, it's launched through IR4 program. So hopefully we're going to see a registration for this. This is going to help us out quite a lot on bindweed. So it'll be a it'll be a summertime application or perhaps a fall application, post harvest kind of thing when you've got a lot of plant material present. But this is going to translocate and do some uh, decent level of control. So hold your thought on this one. Quinstar might help us out. It's not going to be a silver bullet. They don't exist, right? But it's going to help us out, I think. Now, she's going to wrap up. Yes, I can say in conclusion. Uh, perennial weeds, uh, especially considering bindweed, are not likely to be controlled with a single shot. Keep that in mind. It took more than one year to get to the problem. It's going to take more than one year to control the problem, regardless of what you use. Herbicides can get you in that direction fairly quickly, more quickly than cultivating every two weeks. But... Sometimes you have to use them in an integrated way. Sometimes you need to use cultivation as a means to get a lot of new shoots present, and then you can spray out and hopefully get some level of control. So continue to do this integrated strategies. Use cultivation as well as herbicides to kind of get you along the way uh, a little bit better. Um, keep in mind, too, that if you're going to start a new uh, field, you're putting in a new field, gosh, use as much glyphosate as you need to get clean. Get clean is a lot easier than staying clean. It's hard to do if you've got a bindweed population already in the field and you plant into it because we do not have selective materials that are, that are very effective, as you see. So we need to be careful with that. Do what it takes to get rid of those perennial, and that's any perennial weed, but particularly bindweed. Get rid of it before you do any uh, uh, planting. And finally, weed control performance is going to be affected by that biology. Timing, timing, timing. You want to hit it in flower if you can. That's the best time to do it. Keep in mind that if you can get it flat on the ground and it's growing on the ground, then you can use some of these non-selective problems of uh, herbicides a little bit more selectively. Things like glyphosate. If it's growing up over the top of something, uh, you really are limited in what you can do. So keep all that in mind. She ends with a nice weed uh, cartoon, which is everybody like, that's your idea of weed control. Anybody use this method of weed control, by the way? Explosions. Yes, we'll start calling you lefty from your right hand. Uh, questions. Any questions uh, regarding buying weed that I can answer? I think we've achieved that magic moment, Betsy. Is the word? Yeah, I think we're good to go. Can we say the word break? Yeah. <laughs> My pleasure.